In 2008, adventurer Mark Beaumont smashed the world record, cycling around the globe in just 194 days. Now he's got an even more ambitious dream, to cycle the length of the longest mountain range on Earth, the Rockies and the Andes. This epic 13,000 mile expedition is taking Mark from Alaska to the bottom of Argentina. And not content with that, Mark will attempt something never done before, combining the cycle with climbs of North and South America's highest mountains. It's a nine month adventure and this time South America will push Mark's body and mind beyond anything he's experienced before. From an alien world. This terrain is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. To soul destroying winds. There's no way I can cycle into that hour on hour. The solitude of the desert. It's unique, it's, it's stunning. Emptiness is, is its charm. And his biggest challenge yet. Mount Aconcagua. Ah, uh, the top's just there. I can see the top. This is the man who cycled the Americas. With 8,000 miles under his belt, Mark's now leaving Central America and is about to begin the final stage in his incredible journey. I guess it's my turn now. With no roads linking Panama to South America, Mark's hitching a lift through the Panama Canal, crossing the equator and getting back on his bike in Ecuador. This is a brilliant way to finish the Central American adventure through the Panama Canal, one of the most unbelievable experiences of my life, just taking a, a 152 meter boat through those locks. Um, un unbelievable. I'm on a 60 hour voyage now onto the Pacific and from there I'll be back into the Andes, big mountain climbing. I've just got a couple of months to get to Aconcagua and start another major climb. of Ecuador, South America, here we come. Travelling completely alone and filming himself, Mark's back on the road. In sweltering temperatures, he now faces a relentless uphill struggle. These are, without doubt, the toughest roads I've cycled on since Alaska. Miles and miles and miles uphill on dirt. I've been climbing all day up at uh, about 5,000 feet now, and uh, I'm going incredibly slowly. I'm going little more than walking pace. It's uh, not good miles at all. The big concern is just making my average so I can stay on target to get to Aconcagua. constantly uphill, <coughs> Mark's at the top of just one of dozens of mountain passes to come. 
I was meant to reach the little village which is just down ahead by um, uh, by by lunchtime, but uh, yeah, I didn't realise quite how tough today would be. But climbing to this altitude does have a reward, one that should give Mark's legs a boost. Here they grow the prized Café Altura, cultivated above 6,000 feet. This makes the ultimate cup of coffee. After a good night's sleep, however, Mark's caffeine fix is going to be far from instant. It smells amazing. The aroma is, uh, is really strong now. I love coffee. Coffee, uh, coffee's kept me going at many points on this expedition. Very strong coffee. <laughs> it's strong. Si. Fresco. Fresco. Rico. <laughs> Only after several more cups is Mark ready for the road. This is certainly going to give me lots of power to the pedals today. I, I'm sure this is the equivalent of three or four normal cups of coffee. This stuff is uh, potent. Oh. Salut. <laughs> To fulfill his dream of being the first man to cycle between North and South America's highest mountains, tackling both in a single climbing season, Mark's going to need all the energy he can get. He's got to cycle a daunting 3,000 miles in just seven weeks before seasonal weather could make the second climb impossible. With the enormity of the Andes already slowing him down, there's little room for delays. <laughs> I've, uh, I've somehow picked up food poisoning and uh, I've been up pretty much all night. Oh, incredibly ill. <sighs> it's a bit of a blow because uh, there's no way I can ride my bike today. I've got... Uh, I've lost so much time in the mountains uh, this week. But uh, there's no way I can cycle like this. I've not been this ill for years. <sighs> Next day, though, Mark's hauled himself back on the bike. <clears throat> I've already been climbing for about an hour and uh, I can't see any sign of the top. These mountains put you in your place when you're at the speed of a bike, which here is incredibly painfully slow. You suddenly realise what you're up against. Stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. But I was in bed sick yesterday, so I don't quite feel I've got the energy to do this. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'll certainly remember Ecuador. It's kind of throwing everything at me. As Mark leaves Ecuador, at least his legs have a brief rest with a monster four and a half thousand foot downhill to the Peruvian border. It's all right, isn't it? And he should relish this brief surge of speed because of what lies ahead. Mark 
faces two vast deserts. The first stretches the length of western Peru, followed by the great Atacama Desert of Chile. To make matters worse, at this time of year, a relentless wind blows south to north. Cycling in this headwind is just like having a big sail on your bike and it pushing you the wrong way. It's the hardest condition to, to cycle through because it's relentless. It's utterly, utterly relentless. You're getting blasted the whole time by wind and often sand. There's no reward for battling from dawn till dusk through flat deserts against a, a headwind which feels like the steepest of hills all day. More than that, just being wind blasted the whole day takes it out of you. Despite being on the go for 12 hours a day, after a soul destroying week, Mark's been pushed days behind schedule. This, uh, this headwind is just slowly beating me down. It's, uh, it's such, such slow progress into this wind. I'm literally cycling along at walking pace. I feel so tired in the bike as well. The last couple of weeks have uh, really taken out of me and um, Oh, I just, I just, I've got, um, I've still got a month to go to get to, to Aconcagua and I, I don't know if I can, I don't know how I can do it into this wind. This desert watering hole brings not only shelter, but a welcome encounter with a fellow adventurer. Lazaro Martinez Cruz is traversing the length of the Andes in a wheelchair to raise environmental awareness. It's quantum kilometers in total. Bueno, la travesía de los Andes en total, bueno, no hemos, nos falta un poquito por 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 cumplir. Pero estamos más o menos sobre los 8000 kilómetros. 8000. 8000 kilómetros de ruta. Eh, voy a hacerlo más o menos en, en 80 días. Yo salgo a, salgo a las 6 de la mañana y estoy llegando sobre las 5 y media, 6 de la tarde a la ruta de 100 kilómetros, 120, 130 kilómetros diarios. Okay. Es peligroso, pero afortunadamente, pues Dios y la Virgen está con nosotros y ahí vamos. Ahí vamos en la lucha. And he's heading north, I'm heading south, and I'm sure we've got a very different speed anyway, but uh, absolutely brilliant to meet a, a guy like him. I mean, it really does put what I'm doing into perspective. Felipe Aje. He's off again, his wheelchair is fixed. What an incredible character to come across on the roadside. That's off to the guy, that was, uh, that was brilliant. That takes guts. While Lazaro heads north, propelled by a tailwind, Mark pushes on south. This is now a road for the faint-hearted. This is a harsh wilderness dominated by volcanoes and plagued by earthquakes. Despite suffering from long-term fatigue, to reach Aconcagua in time, 
Mark's got to cover over 2,000 miles in less than a month. This means he's pushing a massive 75 miles a day, often on poor roads. I came, uh, came flying down a hill there and uh, around a corner and there was a, a loud twang from the back wheel. I didn't even need to stop and check. I knew immediately that I'd uh, broken a spoke in my back wheel. It's so annoying. It's the last thing I need at the moment. I'm really, really pushing to get these miles in. Five hours later, Mark eventually limps into the nearest tower. His body's crying out for sleep, but he's got hours of work ahead of him. Long days are paying off. Mark's approaching the Chilean border and is back on schedule. Well, this is Chile, second last country, and it's a biggie. A lie ahead lies 600 miles of Atacama Desert, and uh, yeah, what can I say? At least I've had an introduction to the desert already. in the North Chilean city of Arica, the last real civilization before the Atacama Desert, and a vital stop for food and supplies. I've no idea what's in it, but good. It's really good. Atacama is 15 million years old and the driest place on earth. A perfect desert. Blocked from moisture on both sides by the Andes Mountains and the Chilean coastal range, in places it hasn't rained for centuries. This is where NASA tested the Mars Viking probes. They found the soil contained no trace of life. Not even bacteria can survive some of the strongest ultraviolet rays on Earth. It's endless. The road goes without breaks or punctuation of any kind through this world of sand and wind and beating heat. The, the, the scale and intensity of this desert. There is nothing living out here. There's no cactus. There's no lizards and snakes. This is as arid as it gets. To be pedaling through it, I think, is a fairly unnatural <laughs> ambition. I don't think, I don't think humans are meant to be here. It's a dead part of the world, and that's strange. To cycle for days and days and not see 
not see plants or animals or anything. With only his camera for company, it will take Mark two weeks to cross the Atacama. And out here, the night times are as testing as the days. This, uh, this terrain is unbelievable. I've never, I've never seen anything like it. Look, it's like big slabs of earth which have been so wind-beaten and uh, sun-baked. They're like concrete. I mean, when you walk over it, you can. Here, moving. It's like walking on an ice floe, but it's earth. They're like big slabs of ice up against each other. Finding a camp spot away from the wind is a nightly ordeal. Oh yes! Right, that sand. Fantastic. Right, there's there's fresh sand here. Sand. It's as old as the air. <laughs> there's, right, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's sand here, and um, if I spread that out, <laughs> it means I might get some sleep tonight, rather than sleeping on this concrete. It may not be a bed and soft sheets, but this is as good as it gets. I could have been in a lot of trouble there. So I've found probably the only bit of shelter for miles around here. Fantastic, right. Time to get my head down. You're left with your own world in the desert. There's nothing really to distract you from your thoughts. And if you're having a tough time, if you're hurting, if you're battling the wind, then it can be pretty lonely. <laughs> You're far more isolated than uh, in most environments. There's no people, there's nothing living, it's just sand and wind. Of hate at times. There's times where I'm really down. There's times where I'm really down, but what can you do, you know? If it helped at all to cry, I'd cry, but um, yeah. already mentally exhausted. Now the Atacama scouring wind and burning rays are taking their toll physically. I woke up literally with my own voice, just going, ow, ow, I didn't know what it was, I, I couldn't figure it out, but the pain was all through my lower jaw. Um, and it seems silly, because it just looks like a couple of little blisters on my lips, but they're incredibly raw, they're really painful. Fighting into this, uh, this wind is, uh, is not helping it heal. Nothing I've got in my first aid kit seems to be uh, sorting it out, so... I don't want to be starting a climb in Aconcagua with uh, blistered lips. I'm going to have to really try and look after this.
after days of riding through the most remote parts of the Atacama, for the only time in South America, Mark's being joined by a BBC cameraman. He's armed with much needed food and water. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Hey. Look, time no see. So about the bright light. Hey. Good to see you. What time is it? Hey. Uh, but it's kind of middle of the night, so uh, you sorry, to, sorry to wake you up, but uh, I'm going to find where you are. You found me. My directions worked. Welcome to the desert. It's not that luxurious, but um, get your sleeping bags out. There's plenty of space. <laughs> back up camping at the road again. I'm feeling a bit tired this morning, but uh, Nick the cameraman's up and about to film sunrise and uh, the driver, who I don't think knew was going to be camping, uh, we put the tent up for him in the middle of the night. A couple of days of company, food and medical supplies will give Mark the boost he needs if he's to attempt the highest mountain in the Americas. Lunch for you, Mark. <laughs> Sandwich delivery in the Atacama. You can't beat it. Have you toasted it or is that the sun? It's just sun toasted. <laughs> Fantastic. This doesn't normally happen. I'm trying to fan out for the climb, so it'll help. Heading down the Pan American Highway, Mark's now in the southern Atacama. And before the cameraman leaves, he's got a chance to briefly escape the desert at one of the world's most remote human outposts. The Paranal Observatory. Perched on the roof of the Atacama at almost 9,000 feet. With no light pollution and moisture-free air, it's the perfect place to peer into the heavens. But for Mark, it's the first moment he's had to gaze down on the desert. such an inhospitable part of the world. It's beautiful for that though, I mean it's, it's, it's vastness and it's emptiness is, is its charm. But there's nothing living as far as the eye can see, except for a few mad side scientists up on this hilltop looking at space. What a place to work. This is the highlight of the Atacama Desert for me. The, the cycling has been has been beautiful, but uh, massively testing. Just to pause for thought, just to stand above the desert and just take a moment at sunset in a place like this. It'll make me remember it in a totally different way than just battering into that headwind all day, every day. I'll be sleeping in that desert in a few hours. Mark, it's, it's, I've got to leave you now. <laughs> yeah, you arrived in the night. I see you heading off in the night. Where are you? Safe trip home. See you later. See ya. Be safe. <laughs> yeah. A lot more desert to go. You sure you don't want to hang around? No, I'm good. It's, it's, a, it's a lonely old place out here. Yeah. <laughs> see you later. Good, good luck.
It's now just a week until Christmas, and the highest mountain in the Western Hemisphere is just 600 miles away. But after 178 days of cycling with often poor nutrition, the prospect of the climb is weighing on Mark's mind. Getting to Aconcagua is one thing. Getting there in, in shape to, to be able to climb, to attempt to summit successfully, is a worry. Mark's lost nearly two stone in body weight and needs to build his strength up. Something a Christmas present from home might just help with. Mum sent out some, uh, some Christmas cake, which is obviously meant for Christmas, but I'm in the middle of the Atacama Desert. It's 60 miles since the last place I could get supplies. It's... Uh, incredibly nutritious and it's quite heavy so I don't really want to carry it for another week so I've decided that Christmas has come early and I'm going to have some Christmas cake. Fantastic. It better be iced. Is that icing? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I got Christmas cake. Look at this. Mum's Christmas cake. Look at that energy, just fruit and sugar and goodness and icing and... Oh, that is brilliant. Mm. Thanks, Mum. Sorry I couldn't wait for Christmas. Oh, a pile of Christmas cake. A big night's sleep. Anything's possible. <laughs> it's taken Mark two weeks of hard grind, but he succeeded in crossing the Atacama. He's now in the sweeping foothills of the Andes. And whilst there may be signs of life, Mark is still all alone, and today is a special day. It's Christmas. Merry Christmas. I got my Christmas decorations. I can go on the bike today. And I've woken up to uh, thousands of ants in my tent. I don't know how they go into my tent, but uh, a colony of ants I've already got at my breakfast. So Christmas breakfast isn't looking great. Oh well. Woohoo. No one has ever cycled the 11,000 miles between the highest mountains of North and South America, ascending both inside a single climbing season. After an extraordinary last push through Christmas and Boxing Day, Mark is finally approaching Mount Aconcagua. Most people would prepare for a major climb by resting up, eating well, making sure they were in the best physical and mental shape. My, my preparation for climbing the highest mountain in the Western Hemisphere has to put mind and body through everything, every torment you could imagine for over half a year on the bike. I've made it. I've made it down the Americas from Denali to Aconcagua. <laughs> it's just, at this point, it's just a massive, massive sense of relief. I've had a singular focus overriding everything else for over half a year on the bike and that's to get between Denali and Aconcagua 
within time to climb them, and I'm here. I've put so much into this, there would be massive disappointment. I would be kidding myself if I didn't say that I would be, be gutted if I didn't make it to the top. Aconcagua towers in the heart of the Andes at 22,841 feet. It's the highest mountain outside of Asia, and every year its extreme altitude and ferocious weather kills many an able climber. After four days of acclimatizing on the lower hills, Marks arrived at just below 15,000 feet, Aconcagua Base Camp. You need to be with experienced climbers to attempt this mountain, so Mark is joining a small team. It's being led by veteran guide Damien. He's all too aware of the dangers, having lost a good friend to Aconcagua just last year. It's like a chess game. You have to make one move and let the mountain do another move. And if you go too fast, you're going to lose. Also supporting is fellow Argentinian and mountaineer Sebastian. And the summit team is completed with Russian climber hey guys. Oxy. So from here on up, it looks like it gets a lot steeper. Two and a half kilometers. Up. Ah, <coughs> oh, that feels good. I'm ready. Oh, it's heavier than I thought. From base camp up with no mules, this is where the real climb begins. Carrying 25 kilograms, the next few days will reveal if Mark's physically capable of summiting at all. I've not really walked for half a year. I've been on the bike for so long that uh, it's such a different fitness and um, my lower back and legs, they're going to have to adjust pretty quickly. Trying to go to nearly 7,000 meters now is, is uh, it's not, I just don't know how I'm going to react. I don't know how the body's going to adjust. It's hard to walk here at this altitude. Lungs feeling good apart, despite the thinning air about my back, my shoulders. Uh, it's really, really painful. I'm not used to having this, uh, this kind of weight in my back. It's such a different exercise than being on the bike. For the next three days, the team moves up through Camp 1 and on to Camp 2, at just shy of 18,000 feet. Here, Damien receives news that a storm is on its way. They have a weather window of just two days to summit. Without the usual days to acclimatize, they are making a superhuman effort to reach high camp. Yep, we are pretty much at the summit of Kilimanjaro. High camp sits at over 19,000 feet. Up here, there's only 49% of the oxygen at sea level. And collecting snow for vital drinking water is energy sapping. All right. Snow, this snow. Temperatures up here can drop to as low as minus 40 degrees, and with the weather turning, the only chance to summit will be before the high winds forecast later tomorrow. Aconcagua is famous for its high winds more than anything else. It's the thing which gives people frostbite. It's the things which stops people summiting. So 
we're planning to leave the, here for, for the summit before the sun hits the tents. It's, uh, it's the middle of summer in Argentina. <laughs> it is bitterly cold up here. It is really, really cold. It's summit day, but with so little oxygen, no one has slept well. You literally sort of wake yourself up with sort of anxiety because uh, you don't have enough uh, breath. You know, you wake up going, <gasps> and uh, how did you sleep? <laughs> Mal. Mal? Si. <laughs> The summit is seven hours and 3,000 feet above their camp. Okay, guys, poly, poly, slowly, slowly, the first 200 meters. Reaching the top, we'll see the oxygen drop a further 7%. Up here, without acclimatization, you'd be unconscious in less than 12 minutes. 6,400 meters. We're doing really good timing. Team leader Damien must keep them moving. With the weather window closing, he knows Mark will get just one shot at the summit before the high winds arrive. After five grueling hours, and in the nick of time, the team are just 900 feet from the summit. But this last stretch is where the fittest of mountaineers have been beaten. I'm utterly, utterly oh, exhausted. I can see the summit. I feel incredibly weak. Right, all right, I'm just gonna get to the top. Come on. To reach the top is, is an indescribable feeling. It's not just the climb, but it's half a year of cycling before that. Good job, man. What up, buddy? Oh. Awesome. Good job. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we made it! Oh. Oh. That was tough. That was the hardest climb I've ever done. I've made it. The top of Akinkagua. 
Whew. Fantastic. Duro, eh? He's the first man to have cycled between the highest mountains of North and South America and climbed both in a single season. With Akad Kagua conquered, Mark must now get back on the bike and make the final 2,000 mile push through Patagonia to the southern tip of Argentina. It may be the home stretch, but his journey wouldn't be complete without a last struggle with his old friend, the wind. I'm really hurrying into this wind. There's uh, 1,500 miles still to go. At this point, I really feel like I'm running on vapors. Despite the wind, for the last few hundred miles, Patagonia rewards Mark with a fitting backdrop to the finish. It's been an unbelievable journey. Every day and every week and every month on the bike, everything I've seen, everything I've experienced, everyone I've met, all the friendships and the landscapes in, in every extreme, a, a lifetime of experiences in, in nine months. It's fairly humbling to see the world at the speed of a bike. It's given me a whole new respect for the scale and diversity of the world and has undoubtedly changed me. 229 days and 13,000 miles after leaving Alaska, Mark is approaching the most southerly point of the Americas. This is the last 30, 30 kilometers. My stomach's doing absolute somersault. That's the finish, <laughs> down there somewhere. Just a, a, a joy to have beaten the odds on so many counts and a deep sense of satisfaction to make one of my dreams happen. And it's always been about getting to this point. And it's always about finishing the journey. An amazing feeling. It's, uh, it's hard to describe. finally get here is everything. It's, it's, it's very overwhelming. Feels, feels perfect. I made it. any of Mark's epic journey across the Americas, you can always catch up with BBC iPlayer.